Good morning, everyone. I'm going to start with a bit of good news and a bit of bad news, and I'd like to get rid of the bad news first of all. In case you hadn't realised, we're going to go through a, ch a change of refrigerants over the next 20 years. If you didn't know that already, well, we've now told you, and in fact, probably a, over the next five to ten years, it's going to be the fastest phase out for some of the refrigerants. The good news is, is we're actually being given some time to do it. So as far as, as far as we're concerned, there's going to be a gradual process of changing refrigerants as we've done in the past. I'm going to take you through some bits and pieces of history, just to show that actually we've changed refrigerants quite regularly over the past few years. Look at reasons why and look at ozone layers and see, what, see what's happened in the past and see what lessons have been learned from that. Take us through some choices of refrigerants. As you probably realise, there are only certain substances we can use as a refrigerant. Then deal with some of the safety concerns, because I think that's the biggest question at this point in time. And then lastly, what you guys are going to have to deal with. How, what the, what's the changes to the installation processes, etc. Innovation is one of those terms that's been used a lot by air conditioning manufacturers and refrigerant manufacturers or suppliers, etc. Uh, and in fact, the, the basic vapour compression cycles remain the same for over 100 years. But if you think about it, we've changed compressors from reciprocating and, and um, to, through to screws, through to scrolls, and to rotary compressors over a period of time. We've changed heat exchangers and things have become far more efficient. So innovation is a, is a word that air conditioning can be proud of. So let's take a look back to where we were. Early refrigerators were using things like ammonia, methyl chloride, which we know is quite dangerous, sulfur dioxide, it's not nice. There was even refrigerators that actually say that they're using various power, or various means of power, so kerosene, LPG, and e or electricity. It's not surprising these devices ended up in people's backyards because they're actually quite dangerous. And there were several accidents. Now, back in the 1930s, chemists realised that and they developed a series of refrigerants, the refrigerants we were using up until quite recently, R12 and R22. In the 1950s, most air conditioning equipment was using R12. It was easy, it had quite low pressures to deal with, and R11 for uh, larger equipment. They couldn't get their heads around R22 because it was given some problems with compression, but by the early 1960s, equipment became smaller, it became be able to be able to use in smaller houses and small, smaller plant etc because of the use of R22. Now there's a little thing to note here, the pressure difference between R12 and R22 is around about a 1.6 ratio. So pressures actually increased quite significantly and it was a big challenge at the time. If we move forward, you can see through, 19, up th through the 1960s, R12 and R22, R11 were basically the systems that were being used, was being used as a refrigerant. Um, and by 1980, they suddenly discovered there was a hole in the ozone, uh, ozone layer. That, as far as we were concerned, had nothing to do with us. There was lots of things that were going on, lots of studies that were going on. But it actually prompted refrigerant suppliers and air conditioning manufacturers to start to look for alternatives. No one talks about the ozone layer these days. And it's probably for a very good reason. Things seem to be getting better. This was the ozone layer back in 1989. Um, and you can see there's a great big hole where you've got the green areas, you can see there's more ozone and, and over Antarctica there's this great big blue area where there's not much, but very much ozone. If you look at it today, it's actually got a lot smaller. And governments have taken this lesson and said actually, well if we can affect things with policy and legislation and create a better environment, perhaps we can do it with other bits of legislation to ensure that we, we don't damage our envi environment itself at the moment. Things move forward. By 2003, all the manufacturers had stopped using R22, it had been banned in brand new equipment, and we were all using, in terms of DX plant, 407C and 4410A. As of 2010, all stock holding of R22 had finished. And as of December the 31st this year, you are not allowed to use R22. And just to clarify that point for you, if you break into a refrigerant circuit with R using R22 after this date, you are supposed to pump it down and take the equipment from use or put an alternative in. Okay? If you have an electrical component that fails at that particular point, you can change that, that board, but if in effect what you really need to do is remove the equipment from use. And of course in 2015, we'll have the new F-gas regulation coming through. Now the new F-gas regulation is actually driving, it's one of the drivers for us to change refrigerants. It's going to focus on certain areas. Now it hasn't been put through in the EU Parliament at this moment in time, but there are lots of different facets to it and I'm just going to highlight three for you. 
This is to do with new equipment. So by 20, January 2015, all small refrigerators that are using any, any other substance other than uh, hydrocarbon or a, a refrigerant with a GWP below 150 will be banned. So you won't have any ref, uh, small refrigerators using 134i or whatever. Actually, that's not too much of an issue. Actually, but most people have actually dis, uh, moved into this particular sector with hydrocarbons or other refrigerants. This is a big one. By 2020, you won't be able to use refrigerants with a GWP or a global warming potential above 2,500 in stationary refrigeration equipment. This is the death knell of 404A, I'm afraid. Any new equipment that's going in with 404A will need to be converted to 407 or another blender refrigerant. And it's probably the toughest part of the regulation. Something that's also, also been mentioned is a ban on single splits with systems with, with a charge of less than three kilograms, and they can't use a refrigerant that's got a, a GWP of, of less or more, of the, more than 750. Now this doesn't happen until 2025, but it kind of gives you a message that actually all split systems that over a period of time will have to move to an, to an alternative, alternative refrigerant. So what are the alternatives? What can we pick? I mean, there's been lots of seminars, lots of presentations looking at the different alternatives, but here's, here's our view, or here's my view. You can basically see uh, from the first, this, this first part of the slide, we're looking at all HFCs, and I want to say HFCs, I'm talking about the HFCs that are in use at this moment in time. They have high global warming potential, high GWP, anything from around about 1300 to 4000, the lower one being 134A, the higher one being 404A. We know about compressor design with these systems. We know about energy efficiency with these systems. We also know that the refrigerants that we're using in these particular systems are, is actually quite benign, they're quite safe. The A1 rating there is, a, is it comes from EN378 saying it's not flammable and it's not toxic. The cost of the, of the refrigerant we're using is, is very cheap or reasonably cheap and therefore the systems themselves are actually, you know, we're used to the costs. Now one of the alternatives that we can look at is something called R32. R32 is a lower global warming potential, uh, but it's not zero or very close to zero. But uh, as we actually know what it's about, we can know that compressor design costs are reasonably okay. Energy efficiency is very good. But from our perspective, there is a slight change in the risk of, in, in terms of sa uh, safety. It's slightly flammable. Now we'll deal with that issue a bit later on in my presentation. Cost is okay, system cost is okay. But you know, it's basically, you could call it more, more of a drop-in for r 4 There has to be some work done on it. Of course, the other alternative here that we've actually got is, is HFOs, ZE and YF. They're all being spoken about on different presentations again. Uh, they have a very low GWP, but it, in essence, you, uh, and I think the low, one of the latest studies actually says the GWP of HFOs could be less than one, uh, which makes them quite attractive from an environmental point of view. Compressor design, they actually work very similar to off 134A. Depends on what blends you're using, but it's very similar to 134A. Um, energy efficiency is roughly the same. Safety, again, we have this issue with, with a mild flammable, mildly flammable refrigerant. Cost, well, that's a big question mark. No one really knows. I keep on hearing great big numbers, little small numbers. It just depends. And to be fair, the refrigerant has only, only just been developed, and we need to figure out what's going to happen in the future. We are going to have to change our systems a little bit, so the cost of, them, of those go, will go up if you're using HFO refrigerants. Of course, got our old favourite CO2. The supermarkets are using this a lot. It seems to be a, a, a way forward for them. GWP of one, which is brilliant. The problem you have with, with, these, with CO2, though, is pressures. They can be very, very high, and that means your compressor costs will go up and your actual pipe work installation costs can go up. And because you've got so, such high pressures, your efficiencies tend to be lower. Uh, for, for example, typically around about 2.5 for a standard system, whereas you'd be looking numbers over three for, a, for an HFC equivalent. The refrigerant itself is benign. It obviously is used to put fires out. The cost is virtually zero but the, in terms of the refrigerant, but the system itself can be very, very expensive. Supermarkets are finding that out at the moment. They're having trouble with trying to keep the refrigerant within the system once the, um, the, the system is off. Then of course you've got hydrocarbons. We all know about hydrocarbons. R290, R26, R600, propane or butane, they've been around for a long time. And given the right type of application, they are a perfect refrigerant. And when I talk about that, I talk about a seal system or a factory seal system. Compressor and energy efficiency are okay. They are actually flammable or very flammable. As we know, refrigerant cost is okay, but as, because they're flammable, actually the system cost tends to go up. 
all a bit confusing if you ask me. We need to figure out what we're going to use. And I think the one message that I can give you from this is actually there won't be one refrigerant that we'll all be using. It will be a, a mixture of different types of refrigerant at different times. I'm now going to focus on R32, and, and you can basically say what I'm doing with R32, you can deal with our HFOs. They, they tend to be of the same kind of uh, properties in terms of flammability and, and the way the systems work. But also R32 is actually very close to R410A, and there's a very good reason for that. R32 is 50% of R410A. The only reason the other refrigerant was introduced back in the 1980s and 1990s was actually to reduce its flammability. And you can see here, uh, the boiling temperatures are, is approximately the same as R410A, it's slightly higher than R22. Uh, you can see the global warming potential there is 675, which is actually a third of R, R410A. And they, kind, they use the same kind of oil. Pressures, roughly similar. That ratio of 1.6, well the difference between R22 and 410A is about 1.6. It was the same as it was in the, hist in the history of refrigerants between R12 and R22. Uh, we're not really going to face much in the, way, in, the, in the way of a difficulty in dealing with the pressures. And actually R32 gives us some very good benefits. Now, apologies for the graph, but I'll, I'll explain it to you. In, in terms of the vertical axis on this graph, graph, you've got refrigerant charge in kilos. And we've based this on a 3 kilowatt DX system that was built in Japan. And across the horizontal axis you can see COP, so uh, we've actually got 2.53 and 3.5, and the size of the bubble is global warming potential. So you can see here, actually a, a similar system built many years ago using R22 was using around about 1.2 kilos of refrigerant. A similar system today using R32 is re using around about 0.7, so you've actually got quite a reduction in the amount of refrigerant charge you've got. And of course, you've got a much lower GWP, so it kind of makes sense to try and use R32 where we can. And in fact, uh, our colleagues in Japan are already using it extensively. Uh, probably in the reason, region of 200, 300,000 units have been sold in Japan using R32. So if I take a, a four kilowatt split system, which is now on sale in Japan, that we was using R410A, and I keep it the same size, I can increase its efficiency by at least 6% by at least 6%, and that help will help us get us through some EU regulations later on. Of course, if I want to play the other game, I can reduce its volume by at least 18%, I can reduce, reduce the refrigerant charge by at least 20%. So you can see in the future there will be a balance between size and efficiency on these types of systems. And I think that's something that we'll be able to use to achieve the goals that Europe is setting us in terms of um, efficiencies. Okay, so let's talk about the burning issues, the elephant in the room that no one really wants to talk about. If we look at the properties of R32, you can see it's slightly flammable. And that's sli that slightly flammable is rated by ASHRAE. Uh, it's called A2L. The A2L reference doesn't exist in Europe at this moment in time, although European legislation is being adjusted to adopt it. Obviously, 410A is not flammable, and its toxicity is low. The same goes for R22, and you can see that ratio there of 1.6 in pressure difference. So let's burn some. Let's see what happens. Let's see how they, this refrigerant will burn. So let's do it. We, we actually did some tests in Japan. I put it in a cubic meter box. This box was then put inside a test rig, and it, it, was, it was lit, or we tried to light it. And this video here is about 300 grams in a meter cube box, and you can see, well, I, think, I hope you can see, it won't burn. It's basically just sitting in the, the ignition flame is just burning up and it's nothing actually catching fire. We increased the charge to 320 grams. On this particular occasion you can see, and you might just be able to see from there, there's actually the, the refrigerant is beginning to burn but it's actually burning not extensively, just little puffs of blue flame are going up. We have to deal with this in a scientific way. There's no, way, there's no, there's no point in trying to say well, it, it burns or it doesn't burn. Yet there are degrees of ignition. So the latest standard ISO 5149 is actually dealing with this in terms of a burning speed in centimetres a second. So R32 and HFOs will have the similar type, type of test. It's burning at around about 6.7 centimetres a second. It's not a lot. Well, it's not a lot compared with some of the other refrigerants. To give you a comparison, this is R290. It burns at 46 centimetres a second. 
So you can see there's actually quite a marked difference. Now everyone takes the point of it, it's flammable, but actually there are degrees of flammability that we need to adjust to and we need to understand. As I said at the beginning of my presentation, we are going to have to deal with this and we need to, need to understand how that's going to take place. We know roughly what refrigerants we're going to have to deal with. We know that they are going to be mildly flammable because the lower the GWP, it, the refrigerants tend to be mildly flammable. So what processes and procedures are you guys going to have to deal with in the field? Well, we carried out an installation within our Bristol office about six months ago just to understand what we may or may not have to do. So we started by looking at the pipework. Well, actually, the pressures are the same, so you'll be able to use standard flare connections. I think there will be a development where the flares will become match, uh, factory manufactured and you'll do a brace connection to that flare. Site flares have some issues um, and we've, all know, we've known about that for some time. You can do a pressure test, say the normal way, and you'll be able to look for leaks in the same way. So in effect, when you're putting your pipe work in, there's no change. There's no differences whatsoever. The installation process on this particular system, evacuation was as per normal. Again, a recheck on a leak, that was as per normal. You can do that using soapy water again or a leak tester. It's all very straightforward. Again, no change. So at this moment in time, we've now got our outdoor unit and our indoor unit in place. We've piped it up. We haven't changed anything whatsoever. This is where things change slightly. Because R32 is seen as being a reflammable refrigerant, you have to have a cylinder that's got a red collar on it. It has to be pressure tested to 48 bar. Currently they're tested to 40 bar. You can't overfill these cylinders. They can only be filled to a 60% rate. And again, as I identified, they need to red the uh, red shoulder. And the bolts cannot be aluminium. They have to be iron at this moment in time. And to cap it all, we've got a left-hand thread. Now, as soon as you mention left-hand thread, that says it's a flammable refrigerant. You know, it's identifying the fact that there is a risk. So you're going to need some special tooling at that particular point. So I can quite categorically say when you come to charge your system, there is going to be a change. It's not going to be a great big change. You will need a special set of gauges that will be able to deal with R32. But actually, you can go around to any one of the uh, suppliers and you can talk about R32 as, as a refrigerant, and they'll be able to supply you with the set of gauges at this point in time. Tools, gauges, manifold sets, leak detectors are all slightly different. Um, the gauges themselves are, are fairly straightforward, but recovery devices could end up having to be uh, flame-proofed. Uh, there's a discussion going on at the moment. It would make sense to make them flame-proof. So, again, unfortunately, guys, you're gonna, there's going to be new tools required for it, but it's nothing really any different than you would be if you're using another type of flammable refrigerant. What you do have to do is ventilate the system. Now, if you think about it, 99% of all outdoor units are installed on a roof, so it's not particularly too much of an issue. But if you're putting an indoor, an outdoor unit inside, you're going to have to ventilate it to make sure you don't get a build-up of refrigerant during the charge process. And again, here you can see in our test rig, we've actually got a flame-proof fan that's ventilating the area whilst we're going through the charge. It's only to stop a build-up of R32 that could possibly catch fire if you've got a naked flame so again there is a change in the process there so in essence the installation process is exactly the same you know R32 and R410A you're not going to worry about the pipe work tooling is slightly different and the safety requirements of ventilation recovery centers are different and we're going to have to deal with that if I put it into a table you can see there quite clearly you know what's an X and what's a red there's something that's quite interesting though R410A, you're supposed to use ventilation when you're installing the outdoor units inside. That's because the two constituent parts of 410A could actually separate out and you could get a, a mixture of R32 in there that is flammable. And I bet you not one of you actually do that. If you put in a, a system in indoors, you don't actually do that. In essence, though, there's not a lot of difference. There's not a lot of change. You just need to know how to deal with it. So we've put some recommendations and some advice to you guys. I, first thing I always say is look out for ACRIB um, uh, announcements from the IOR, or uh, announcements from FGAS from ACRIB, IOR and DEFRA. Go and talk to REFCOM today. Um, there are actually some quite big developments that are going on with FGAS inspections. Make sure you're FGAS registered and trained. It's going to become absolutely critical. If you're not already, again, there are people around here that will help you with that. 
Look out for manufacturing training courses. Those of you who remember the change from 22 to 407 c to 410A, there was a lot of support from, man from manufacturers. It helps us make sure you're installing the equipment properly. It's probably too early to ask manufacturers at this point for these training courses, but over the next year or so they'll start to be developed. Keep your systems correctly maintained and regularly checked to the FGAS regulations. And one of the things I always say is make sure you inform the end users of their obligations under the FGAS regulation. When the new regs kick in in 2015, it's going to become even tighter to make sure that we're not leaking refrigerants. <clears throat> and make sure your site logs are kept up to date. FGAS is driving regulations. It's driving regulations that's going to change the refrigerants we use. Lower GW, GWP refrigerants tend to be flammable, and the question is by how much. Don't be frightened by flammability. Manage it. Deal with it. The phase down of refrigerants, as we currently know, is going to take an extended period of time, and we can foresee our 410A being used as late as 2030. And the amount of grey hair I've got, I can, you can see it lasting me. Okay. Our, our 32 in systems will start with small splits and then move on to bigger systems as we move forward and make sure anyone that's using HFC refrigerants are FGAS trained. Thank you for your time. Um, any questions at all? Will ammonia have any resurgence at all? Yes, it will, yeah, it will have. There'll be, a, there'll be a test that'll be carried out in it to see if, what its propagation rate is and, and you know, it will be what it will be. It'll be something between what we've currently got with R32 and what we've got with, with R290. And I think it makes sense to be honest. Any other questions at all? When's R32 likely to be seen in the UK? Um, if you check the cooling blog this morning and the RAC mag, we're expecting R32 systems from Daikin in 2015. <clears throat> it will only be smaller split systems, but as I intimated, they're already being used in Japan. It makes sense for us to start bringing it in. And this 2025 date in, for the FGAS regulation, actually I can see us fulfilling that requirement probably in the next three to four years, which is good news. Any more questions from anyone? While we're around, if you want to talk, I've been asked to say, tell everyone that there is actually an open seminar on our new products in there, so if you want to learn about VRV4 heat recovery, please feel free. Thank you for your time. <laughs>